The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the bread or the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then he said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Be seated, please. Presbyterian minister Ted Wardlaw tells of the time a church salesman came into his church office attempting to sell him some board games for the church youth. And the top of the line game was called Dollars and Cents. It was a board game, much like Monopoly. And the salesman said it was a great game for teaching the kids Christian economics. Here's how it worked. If the players landed on a square labeled college graduate, they received a certain sum of money. And if they landed on a square named middle level executive, they received a greater sum of money. But if they were lucky enough to land on a square labeled company president, they received a huge amount of money indeed. But regardless of the money they received, if they gave 10% to the church square on the board, and here's the alleged lesson in Christian economics, they would reap a bonanza by landing on the showers of blessings square, thus being showered with all the money in the jackpot. <laughs> Pastor Wardlaw was not impressed with the slick salesman or the game. That's a crass lesson to teach a child, he responded. How in the world can you even begin to associate the word blessings with jackpot. But the salesman did not flinch. He looked Pastor Wardlaw straight in the eye and he said, yes, Reverend, but isn't that the way the world works? Unfortunately, that is the way the world works. So often we might think to ourselves, I'm hungry for some kind of blessing in my life. When what we more often than not need is, or want at least, is some kind of jackpot, even if it's just a small jackpot. So what's the difference? Well, blessings are a sign, as Jesus points out, of God's presence, God's grace. These are the gifts in our lives from God that deepen and enrich our humanity. Jackpots, they're just a sign of luck. Windfalls that give us so much of what so many people are chasing after today, power, recognition, and wealth. A child in school, for example, who has a passionate and caring teacher has received a great blessing, right? A gambler in a casino who comes up big that day has received a jackpot. 
And sadly, given the choice, so many today would happily trade the passion of learning for a few lucky rounds at the casino, right? Yes, Reverend, but isn't that the way the world works? This preference for jackpots over blessings today is all too common. And perhaps we have this picture of, of wealthy Wall Street financiers managing leveraged buyouts of companies whose employees they never, neither know nor indeed care about, simply again to line their pockets. And they might say, being in the right place at the right time, this was such a blessing. But Jesus would say, that's no blessing. That's a jackpot, pure and simple. I doubt that anyone has ever confessed on his or her deathbed, I wished I had worked harder on those weekends. Boy, I wish I had stayed more evenings at the office. If only I could have spent less time with my children. And yet, how do we live sometimes? We find ourselves doing just that, hustling past all of life's blessings in search of some elusive jackpot. Yes, Reverend, but that's just the way the world works. Today we hear of the crowds who bought into the menta that mentality. They have been fed by Jesus on the mountainside, and now they're following him again all the way across the sea to Capernaum. And maybe at first glimpse, we're impressed by their thirst for his teaching, his knowledge. And the crowd appears to be hungry for a blessing. <laughs> Not really, Jesus says. He discerns their true motive, and in fact, he calls them right out on it. He says, you're not looking for me for a sign of God's grace. You're looking for me simply because you were well fed. They're not looking for a blessing at all. They're looking for another jackpot. Why does Jesus challenge their motives? He perceives that they are indeed in search of better lives, like many of us are, but on their terms. Jesus sets out to give them spiritual life while they simply want an improved lifestyle. And come to think of it, not a lot has changed with humanity over the years, has it? My wife will tell you that I've purchased way too many cars over the years. It's probably true. But every time I've gone, for the most part, it's been a very positive experience. But on one occasion, I remember bumping into this rather young, nervous salesman and evidently, he'd been trained to size me up financially. And so after some small talk, he quickly asked me, so, what do you do for a living? And my standard response is to say, I'm a grave digger. <laughs> I like to see where it goes. But this time, I decided to be honest with the guy, and I said, well, I'm a Lutheran pastor, I said with a smile. And the salesman suddenly became blank in the face, almost ashen. You could just hear him saying to, or thinking to himself, what do I say to a minister? And after a rather long and awkward pause, he replied, and I'm not making this up, he said to me, well, I read the Bible to improve my sales. <laughs> there it is again. The confusion over a blessing and a jackpot. The salesman had no doubt thought he was doing something quite righteous, reading the Bible when his sales performance needed some kind of boost. But then he presumed that God's job was to make his life better, to make him richer or more successful, whatever it was. And you hear that preaching all the time. It's called the prosperity gospel. You especially hear it out of the South. We do the same thing. The same thing when we assume that God's role is to assure that our various designs and plans and schemes work out smoothly. And so often that's what we pray about. But that's not a blessing, Jesus says. That's a jackpot you're after. Yes, Jesus seeks to feed each of us, but he's not a short-order cook making food just to suit our whims. I remember back when our two boys were really little, and they hardly ever liked anything we put before them for dinner. And our oldest son, Brett, had this love affair with macaroni and cheese. That's all he ever wanted. He thought that he could live forever on macaroni and cheese. I remember going to the grocery store one day and coming home with 60 boxes of macaroni and cheese. Because <laughs> it was hopeless. I had to feed the kid. That's all he would eat. Got a lot of strange comments from the cashier that day. 
Fortunately, Naomi and I knew that he needed more than just what he craved. He needed a balanced diet. But not surprisingly, as adults, we, we do the same thing, don't we? Spiritually, when we become spiritually picky people, choosing only our favorite portions of the spiritual bread that Jesus offers us. And these are the portions that we feel are least likely to offend, or least likely to cause us to have to rearrange our lives, our priorities, or change too much of something that we're not sure we want to take the risk with. Spiritual pickiness is not a healthy habit, right? It leads to serious malnutrition, not only of our lives, but of our spirits. And Jesus here stresses to the crowd today that the bread he provides offers fulfillment not only to their mind, but their body and their spirit as well. Those who eat of this bread, he says, will never hunger again. There's a story of an old rabbi who had lived in Germany, but then in his later years moved to England, where he had died. And in the obituary, he had shared the story of his youth, how when he was a little boy, his family was imprisoned in the Nazi death camps. And the prisoners then were given just barely enough food to survive each week. They were given some grain, maybe some stale bread, and a little bit of lard. And despite their harsh environment, this boy's family continued to observe the Sabbath. And scrounging up a little piece of candle, a little food each week, they would gather, say their Sabbath prayers, and then pronounce God's blessings. He recalled one week, however, when there was no candle. So when the evening came and the Sabbath arrived, the father took some of that precious lard and molded it around a little piece of string. And then lighting this makeshift candle, he began to lead his family in the prayers and the blessings. Meanwhile, the son was absolutely enraged. And when the prayers were finished, he confronted his father. He said, how could you do that, Dad? How could you waste what little lard we have to make a candle? It's the only food we have. His father paused, put his hand confidently on his son's shoulder, and answered, Son, without food, we can live for several days. But without hope, we cannot live a single hour. Do not work for the food that perishes, Jesus said, but for the food that lasts for eternal life. Let us pray. Lord, you know how hungry and thirsty we are, and yet we don't understand it. We hunger and thirst for food, for material things. We hunger spiritually, but we're so confused over our priorities and what it is that truly gives us life. Today again, Lord, you offer us yourself. In your body and your blood, you proclaim that here and now we have that gift of eternal life. Lord, help us today to have our hunger and our thirst met in you, in this company of saints, and whatever restlessness we have, whatever hunger or thirst that still abides, may the satisfaction of your spirit and your presence truly fill us today. In your name we pray. Amen.